everybody. Good morning and welcome to the Christocentric meal, a daily reflection of your true identity in Christ Jesus. Abel Damina is my name and I'm excited today to welcome every one of you to this wonderful time where you eat your daily bread in God's word. Joining me this morning is my wife, Dr. Rachel Damina. Honey, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Christ Centered Meal. And you know we're excited today. And just before we pray, do me a favor. Invite a friend, a family. If you're on Facebook, tag some people. If you're on YouTube, invite some people. Let's really feast in the word of his grace. Honey, just pray as we begin the day. Loving Father, we thank you that you are here with us and in us. Everything that is in your heart will come through our mouth to our listeners today in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Well, today we're looking at how did God forgive sins? You know, because we already looked at how did God forgive sins part one yesterday. Mm -hmm. Today we're looking at how did God forgive sins part two. Now, yes. we established yesterday that in Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. The blood of the New Testament. We saw from Luke 1, 77, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. And we took time to do some exegesis on the day of atonement. And we saw all the details under the shadows of what necessitated the day of atonement and what made the day of atonement a reality. And then we saw that in the New Testament, Jesus is the substance of all the shadows and all the practices in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was temporal with Christ Jesus salvation and the forgiveness of sins is eternal and unconditional because it is predicated on the finished work of Christ. And I remember the points we rounded up with yesterday which are very powerful. Was number one, Jesus' offering has taken away sins forever. Yeah. Number two, it is based on this that a man is forgiven once and for all. It is eternal in nature. Glory. Number three, when a man believes and receives the gospel, he has received forgiveness and remission of sins eternally. The believer, therefore, is the new man or the man forever forgiven. And then we say sin no longer stands between the believer and, and God anymore. anymore. So today we're looking at how did God forgive sins in continuation. We identified the word forgiveness as implying to give forgiveness freely or to forgive. By the way, when the word forgive is used in present tense participle, it was always used for believers to forgive one another or others. Mm. Because, you know, there are some verses in the New Testament mm. that talk about forgiveness. Mm -hmm. So forgiveness in present tense is between believers. Yeah. Christ's forgiveness is past tense, yeah. is what he has done. Yeah. It is because of what Christ has done mm. that we can forgive one another. All right? So we're going to move into that today. Recall that the subject of forgiveness is always taught in the past tense and as a gift of God, giving without conditions in the epistle. That's what we've established in the past few days. Mm -hmm. So we may therefore need to ask, is forgiveness what God does or what he has done? Let's examine a few scriptures to establish that position. We will look at Paul's commentary, John's commentary, and James's commentary. Let's begin with Paul. Yes. Ephesians 4.32. Honey, read for us. Ephesians 4.32. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven, forgiven you. you. Okay? Romans 4.7. They whose iniquities are forgiven. Forgiven. Okay? Past, past. Colossians 2.13 Having forgiven you all your trespasses. Having forgiven you all, all trespasses. trespasses. Hallelujah. So, with God from the Pauline commentary is past. past. Let's look at John. Mm. 1 John 2.12 Because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. So, Paul and John emphasized a past tense act which in other words means that forgiveness is not what God will do or what he does, but rather what he has done in Christ and for Christ's sake. Mm. 
That's forgiveness yeah. from uh, God's perspective. Oh, yeah. But let's look at Brother James's commentary. James also wrote concerning the subject of forgiveness. But it appears he alone used forgiveness in the present tense. Mm -hmm. Honey, read for us James 5, 14 to 16. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15. Yes. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Verse 16. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So by using the word, shall be forgiven him, mm. it suggests James was referring to what God will do. Mm. Hence, we need to understand James' discussion in context. Mm. All right? Observe from James chapter 5, that text, there are two things that are outstanding. Number one, James never asks the sick to confess his sins to God, but states that if he has committed any sin, they shall be forgiven him by fellow believers. Oh. Yes, by fellow believers. Yeah. Number two, James did not say confess your faults to God, but to one to another. another. Yeah. Thus, James was teaching on restoration of relationships among believers. One, one to another. another. Hallelujah. We can therefore ascertain from our study yesterday and today that number one, forgiveness is not what God does. Neither is it an ongoing work. Mm -hmm. It's not what God does. Yes. It's not an ongoing work. Yes. But forgiveness is what God has done for us in Christ and received by faith. Yes. That means if we are brethren, mm. and I offend you, yeah. okay? Mm. I don't need God's forgiveness. Yeah. I need your forgiveness. Yeah. So I confess to you what I have done to you and ask you for forgiveness. Because it's not God I have offended. Yeah. It's you I have offended. Yeah. So it's your forgiveness I need. But you will forgive me because, because you too have received forgiving. God's forgiveness. Yeah. And you knew that God forgave you unconditionally. He forgave you without any demand. Yeah. So it is easy for you, the same way you have received God's forgiveness, to forgive me. Yeah. So forgiveness in the present terms, in the writings of Brother James, was between brethren for the restoration of relationship. But with God, overwhelming evidence in the New Testament Abounds. is what God has already done. So all who have believed the gospel have received forgiveness. Yes and have forgiveness as a present day reality. Once you believe the gospel, forgiveness is a present day reality. Acts 13, 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins. Is preached unto you. Is a preaching because it has been offered already. So why do we preach it? So you can receive it. Yes, look God at doesn't verse. forgive. He has already forgiven. And the next verse. Yes. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. So justification is by faith. Hmm. Once you believe, all that believe. you are justified. Yes. The word justified means declared righteous. righteous. You are declared righteous by believing in the message. What is the message? Christ died. He was buried. Uh, uh, on the behind. third day, he rose again for, for justification. your justification. As I put it like this, he was wounded for our, our uh, transgression, bruised for uh, our uh, iniquities. Uh, the chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, yeah. we are healed. Is that, he took my place, I take his place. When you believe that, you, you are, are justified, justified from, from all things, things which you could, could not, not be justified. justified by yes. the law of Moses. That is, no matter your morality and no matter your you perfection, cannot. you cannot be justified. Oh, yeah. Only Christ's blood mm. justifies man. In the book of Romans 5, one brother Paul says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, mm. by whom we have access into this grace wherein we stand. We stand in grace. We stand in grace. Honey, look, yeah. Do you see, it's a, it preached unto you the forgiveness of sin. It's preaching. Today, many preachers preach sin. Your, mm -hmm, how, you know, 
how condemned you are, yes. not the forgiveness. Yes. They make you feel like you need some kind of attitude in your yes. in yourself yes. to qualify yes. to receive forgiveness. Yes. Instead of preaching forgiveness has already been freely exactly. given. Forgiveness exactly. has been paid for. Look at the problem. The mm. problem with today's preachers yes. who will not preach what Christ has done. Yes. Read for me this um, Romans chapter 10 from verse 1 to verse 3. Okay. You know, read it in the message translation. Okay, this message. Yes. Mm. Believe me, friends, all I want for Israel is what's best for Israel. Salvation, nothing less. I want it with all my heart and pray to God for it all the time. I readily admit that the Jews are impressively energetic regarding God, but they are doing everything exactly backward. Yeah. They don't seem to realize that this comprehensive setting things right that is salvation is God's business. Yep. That's setting things right. Yeah. I think we call it uh, restitution. Yes. And the most flourishing business it is. Right across the street, they set up their own salvation shops and noisily hawk their wares. After all these years of refusing to really deal with God on his terms, insisting instead on making their own deals, they have nothing to show for it. They have refused to deal with God on, on his, his own, own terms. terms. So because of that, they are doing everything backwards. backwards. Instead of preaching the forgiveness of sins, they are preaching you are a sinner. sinner. You see, the message is the forgiveness because of sins. everyone knows that they are sinners. Yes, everyone knows. Yes, so there is no good news uh -huh. in telling, in telling a me I'm a sinner. Is a sinner. Because the good news there is in telling a sinner that their sins forgiveness. are forgiven. Yes, for you. That's the good news. Ah, and that's the gospel. What do you know? What I've done? Say yes. There's forgiveness for yeah, That's the gospel. It's available. That's the gospel. Hallelujah. The forgiveness of sins through this man is the forgiveness of sins preached and all are justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of moses look at another scripture honey i want you to read this scripture from um same romans chapter 4 you know uh verse 25 the last the last verse from the king james version okay. romans 4 25. who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification so his resurrection was our justification his death was the payment for our offenses all our transgressions all our sins were paid by the death of christ mm. and when he rose from the dead it was an announcement of his justifying us so the believer does not have sin in his record the believer is the righteousness of god in christ jesus therefore the one who has believed the gospel will not be forgiven Hmm. Because yes. he has been forgiven and eternally by God. Yes. He has been eternally forgiven. On the read Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 to 9. Yes. But now had he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the day is come, said the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. You see that? A new covenant, not according to the covenant that was made with the Old Testament people, which was predicated on what man can do to qualify. The covenant that Christ made with God on our behalf is predicated on what he has done, that you believe, and at the point of believing, you are forgiven. So the New Testament is different from the Old Testament. The Old Testament is a relationship with God that is built on what man will do to qualify. The New Testament is a relationship with God that is based on what Christ has done, that the believer in him, has been justified by. Hallelujah. So the believer in Christ Jesus today is not a sinner. Mm. Yes. Neither is he a sinner saved by grace. <laughs> no. The believer in Christ today is a saint saved by grace. Mm. He's oh. a saint Hallelujah. saved by grace. The believer in Christ Jesus today is in an eternal union with Almighty God. Eternal. The believer in Christ today can never have sin standing between him and God. God. Please don't forget the points, the key points for today. That from the things we studied yesterday and today, we can conclude that forgiveness 
is not what God does. Neither is it an ongoing work. Forgiveness is what God has done for us in Christ. And it is received by faith. That all who have believed the gospel have received forgiveness. And have forgiveness as a present day reality. That the one who has believed the gospel will not be forgiven. Because mm -hmm. he has been forgiven eternally mm -hmm. by God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 12 to 18. Hon. Mm. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Yes. For by one offering he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Yes. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he has said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. The forgiveness of sins is eternally offered to the sinner who believes on the finished work of Christ. I believe that if pastors and preachers of the gospel will preach the finished work of Christ enough, mm. guilt will be gone. Yes. Condemnation will be gone. Mm. Sin consciousness will be gone. Even sin itself will be totally destroyed. Mm. Because Romans 6.14 says, sin shall not have dominion over okay. you because you're not under the law but under grace under the law sin has dominion because there's no cure for sin mm. there's only a covering yes but under grace sin has no dominion because jesus the lamb of god has destroyed and That's taken awesome. away sin he has taken away the sin of the world and it is administered at the point of believing, believing. the moment you believe you're no more a sinner yes you become the righteousness of, of God, God in Christ Jesus. Yes. At the point of belief, yes. the, the effect, the power of sin is destroyed yes. in, during your belief, yes. I mean, at the point of your belief. Yes. So that its effect, its hold over you is broken. Yes. Because now you have a new nature, yep. the nature of Jesus. Yep. And in this nature comes with it everything that makes one like God. Yep. You know, So it's not you receive the forgiveness of God, then you now try to now keep the laws. Mm -mm. Because in itself, inherent in the nature of God is goodness from yep, God, yep. which will, as you acknowledge, it exudes through you. It begins to show. True. And people can see True. the or the, renew, uh, the rebirth yep. that has taken place. In the life. truth is the new life of God take up residence on mm, the inside of yes, man yes. at the point of regeneration. Yes. In fact, watch, you can even read it from Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, you will love this. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now the problem with many believers is they don't even know that there is sin as a noun and sin as a verb. In this chapter of Romans 6, the word sin, there was a noun. What he's simply saying is he didn't say, shall we continue to sin? He said, shall we continue in sin? He didn't say, shall we continue sinning to sin, mm. or to sin? He said, shall we continue in sin as a state? Mm. As a state, in your, in, you know. a born-again man cannot continue in, in sin, sin as a state sin. because you're no more in sin. He's in Christ. That is why he answered the next verse. Mm. God forbid. Yeah. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And this is where some of those boys who don't read the Bible very well get it wrong by saying mm. sin is dead. Oh. Sin is not dead. It is the man. That, that is, is in dead. Christ, that, that is, is dead, dead to, to sin. sin. There is still sin in the world. There is sin everywhere. There is still sin in the mm. world. But the man that is in Christ has died to, to sin. sin. Yes. He has died to sin. He is no more aware of yes. sin. Yes. Because sin is no more in his nature. Yes. But the man that has not received yes. Christ yes. is still alive normal. to sin. He yes. is still alive yes. to yes. sin. very normal. Yes. Just sin is his nature. Yes. Sin is his environment. Yeah, exactly. You know? In fact, read it again. Let them hear it. Verse 2. Yes, verse 2. God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? We are the ones that, that are, are dead. dead to sin because of eternal life mm. in us. All right? Read the next verse. Know ye not. So knowledge is critical. Yes. You must. That's why this devotional, you can't afford to play with it. Mm. Know ye not. Don't you know? That is, there's something you need to know. And that's what you're knowing and learning here. Know ye not. That so many of us as we're baptized into Jesus Christ, we're baptized into his death. 
And this baptism is not water baptism. It's, not, uh, uh, it's receiving is, Christ. Yeah. When Christ entered your heart, you were immersed into, into Christ. His death. You were lost into Christ. Mm. So it is no longer you but Christ. Colossians 3, 4, we say, when Christ who is our life, Christ is our yeah. life. He is our life. So know ye not, as many of you as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Because that death is by identification. Yes. When he died, I died. He died. We died to mm. sin. Yes. We and died to rose, sin. And when he rose, up. we rose. That's why we are justified Goodness. by yes. his resurrection. Yeah. His resurrection justified yes. us. All right, Just so read up. Made us as if we never did. Yes. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Yes. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So the resurrection is our new life. Yes. So we walk The in resurrection new is life. our new, new life. life. So the born again man, it's not somebody that has experienced character modification. modification no. No. It's, it's not a refurbished newness. being. No. It's no. not a reconstruction. Mm -mm. The born again man is a brand new man. Yes. Brand new man. And this brand new man came with his character, his charisma, and everything he needs. Mm -hmm. And as he keeps looking into the word of God as a mirror every He's day, changed. that character, that whole being into that came image. in as a new man mm. begins to, to find expression. expression. Yeah. It begins to find expression. That is why the best thing you can do for any believer is to bring him to this mirror that we are putting before you every day. Every day. We bring to you this Christocentric meal, which is a mirror. We stand it before you. Your and then you begin Christ to Jesus. look in the mirror By to see your true identity Bosch, in Christ Jesus. Yeah, know ye not that as many of us as were baptized into Christ, we were baptized into his death, and that baptism gave us the newness of, of life. life. The born again man is walking and operating mm -hmm. in the newness yes. of life. Therefore, if any man in Christ is a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, this man is living in the fullness of a new life. Praise if God. we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, yes. we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. That's right. See Identification. That's simple. Identification. He's alive, when he died, alive. he died. When he rose, we rose. And we and in him union, so are right. in an inseparable union. union, eternal union with God. Hmm. God in us, that's we right. in God. Yeah. He lives in us. We, live, we are fused into each other. And nothing can ever separate us, not even sin. Mm -hmm. That's what Brother Paul was talking about in Romans when he says, What shall separate us from the love of God? Not from our love for God, but from the love of God. And that love is expressed in Christ Jesus. And he says, Nothing shall separate us, not life, not death, not nakedness, not peril, not sword, not things present, not things to come. Nothing, no height, no depth shall be able to separate us from this union that we have with Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. What a blessing. Okay. Honey, just say this. Let's say these words together, this confession before you pray. Mm. Forgiveness is what God has done in Christ. Forgiveness is what God has done in Christ. For me. For me. This is not dependent on my ability. This is not dependent on my ability. But on the reality. But on the reality. Of what I have. Of what I have. In Christ Jesus. In Christ so Christ. I am. So I am. What the word says. What the word says. I am. I am. Amen. Amen. And the word says you are righteous. Yeah. The word says you are sanctified. Mm -hmm. The word says you are perfected. And the word says you are accepted oh, yeah. in the beloved. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And that is your reality. Mm -hmm. Irrespective of how you feel today. Your reality. Is that you yeah, are accepted? Accepted. Yeah, you yeah, are yeah. the righteousness of God. You don't need to pray in a particular way to Wait, be accepted. To be, uh, no, you don't have to behave in a particular way today mm -hmm. to be accepted. You don't even have to look like spiritual. You know, these people that always look like they are spiritual. Mm -hmm. In fact, they are actually carnal <laughs> because real spiritual people. <laughs> that means they are in the flesh to yes, have to yes. pose. To real spiritual people that. don't have to act it. No, you don't have That's to act exactly it. It's their are. nature. You just be. Right. You don't try to be. You Glory be. Glory to Jesus. You be who you are really. in Christ Jesus. Glory. Only pray for our viewers Glory. today Glory. and Lord, rebuke anything that stands against Glory. this reality in their life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. For our status. Yes. I release upon our viewers this understanding, yes. this light. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Amen. That they begin to pray from the point of saved. Yes. They begin to speak or to interact yes. from the point of righteous. Yes. That they begin to operate and deal among themselves and with you, Lord, yes. from the point of justified. Yes. That they begin to live their lives from the point of redeemed. Yes. They begin to operate circumstances 
from the point of the righteous. Yes. Lord, that they will no more live with guilt complexes. Kabataka. No more live in fear. No more live in timidity. Yes. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for freeing them once again from the yoke of bondage, from yes. the, the, the elements of the world. Yes. And causing their inner man to awake to this truth in yes. the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption. Yes. Whereby we cry, Abba, Abba Father. Father. We take authority right now yes. over every fear. Come you ahead. spirit of fear. We bind you spirit of mm -hmm. fear. We bind you spirit of fear. God has not given to you the oh. spirit of fear, but of love, of power, and of a sound mind. The fear of the future. The fear for your children. Fear for your marriage. All those fears, they are from the devil. Oh, yes. And we bind the spirit of fear from your territory. Yes. We rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we lose you to enjoy the liberty of sons. Yes. We lose you to walk in the liberty that Christ has made available yes. to you. And we cast out fear oh, yes. by commending to you the love of God. There is no fear in the love of God. When you understand the love that God has for you, perfected love, cast out fear. Amen. For he that feareth is not made perfect in love. So we pray that you be perfected today yes. in the love of God. Hallelujah. That you mature, that you grow in the revelation of the love that God has for you. And we decree that because God loves you, no weapon formed against you today yes. shall prosper. prosper. You are blessed beyond the cause oh, yes. in the name of Jesus. Amen. Great grace is upon your Glory. life. Great grace is upon Hallelujah. your family. And great grace is upon your businesses. Yes. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Oh, praise God. What a blessing today. Hallelujah. We want to encourage you to make sure you order for this Christocentric meal devotional. Mm -hmm. Get it for you. Get it for your friends. Get it for your loved ones. And don't forget two books we've already made presented to you. The Believer's Work of Victory. Overcoming Sin Consciousness. And Life Before the Cross. And Life After the Cross. These are resources. There will be a great deal of blessing to you. And you can order for our audio and video teachings on Unmasking the Accuser. Very brutal. Mm -hmm. Brutal teaching. <laughs> Unmasking the Accuser and Overcoming Sin Consciousness. We have them both in audio and video formats. You can order for it. The announcer will tell you how to get it right to where you are around the world, anywhere around the world. But we're excited that we're able to bring resources from God's word to build you and equip you to do the works of Jesus oh, yeah. in your lifetime. Only one more last word for our viewers before we wrap up. Believe me, keep joining us for this daily devotional centered on Christ, yes. on the person of Christ, yes. and all that you have done you know, on your behalf. Amen. Amen. And you know, guys, we love you. We're glad that we're able to bring the word of his grace to you every day. And every day we're able to keep the mirror before you so you see your true reflection in Christ Jesus. Don't fail to get your daily bread tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Invite friends, loved ones, tag people, share with people what's going on right here on this platform. And until we come again your way tomorrow, this is Rachel Damina and Abel Damina saying that the kingdom of God is in power. Amen. Hello everybody, welcome to this segment of the Christocentric Meal, the question and answer session. It gives me delight all the time to bring clarity and to bring understanding to every one of you on subjects we have thought or subjects of scripture. It is a job of a pastor to bring clarity to those areas that are shady where your understanding is concerned so you are well equipped well grounded in the message of christ and i've been receiving a number of questions and i'm committed to answering them as the days go by well today somebody just sent us a question on how do i find a good local church how do i find a good local church this is a very critical and important question how to find a good local church. First of all, you must realize that Jesus' desire for believers is to belong to a local church. In the prophecy, the scripture says, God sets the solitary in families, in families. Jesus, before he died, said, I will build my church upon a rock and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. When he rose from the dead, he had purchased his own church with his blood, and that's the universal church. But the universal church has segments called the local church, 
And I'm going to give you scriptures quickly to establish that fact. The local church is a gathering of believers in a particular location, a physical particular location as a part of the universal church. Romans chapter 12 verse 5. So we be many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another. We be many are one body in Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, be many, are one body, so also is Christ. All right, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12. Brother Paul will put it like this to the church at Ephesus, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were afar or afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So the universal church, the one body of Christ, has many members. Now to show you about the local church, the local church has a well-defined location. Well-defined location. Colossians chapter 4 verse 16. It says in Colossians 4 16, and when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Okay? That's a location. That's a local gathering of believers. Romans chapter 16, just to establish, because a lot of people are going around saying, you don't need a local church, you don't need a pastor, Jesus is your pastor, you are born again, that is all that matters, it's Jesus that died for you, you know, and all of these kind of talks are going on. And because of that, we need to establish clarity in this area. First of all, you must realize, it was Jesus who died. And when he rose from the dead, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, the first thing he did when he ascended up on high was to give gifts to men. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastoring teachers for the perfecting of the saints. So Jesus has appointed the fourfold ministry in the local church. In the local church. The local gathering of believers for believers to be perfected. It's Jesus that set that order. In fact, look at that scripture I'm about to read. In the book of Romans, Romans 16, 1, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at St. Crea. St. Crea. So Phoebe was a servant, a worker, in a particular church, in a location. We have seen Laodicea. We have seen St. Crea. Even the church at Ephesus was a location. Colossae was a location. Philippi. They were all locations where churches were. Physical buildings, physical locations where believers assembled a, a gathering to be equipped because that's the essence of church. And I'm going to get there in a bit. Look at that same Romans chapter 16, verse number 4. Who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches, local assemblies, churches of the Gentiles. Verse 5. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Another location, church in their house. It's not the building that makes the church. It's the gathering. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there in their midst. That's the gathering, the local assembly, which is part of the universal body of Christ. The local church, which is part of the universal body of Christ. He said, greet that church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Ephenetus, who is the first fruit of Asia unto Christ. So, the scriptures in the epistles clearly indicate to us that there is a universal church and there is a gathering called the local assembly, where every believer must, must belong. Look at the book of 1 Timothy 3.15. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself, in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So there is a way to behave even in the local church. He even tells us how to behave yourself in a local gathering, in the local assembly of believers. 
All right, let me also show you another scripture because the local assembly has a well-defined leadership in the epistles. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 to 13. He says there, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Among you and are over you. Spiritual authority. They are over you. They are among you. He says you should know them that labor, not they that have titles, they that labor among you and are over you and admonish you. Then the next instruction, and to esteem them very highly, to esteem them, not to insult them, not to abuse them, not to make mockery of them, but to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. You esteem them in love for their work's sake. I know that there are people who have come up in the, with the name of pastor and prophet and all that that are taking advantage of gullible believers that are not even laborers in the world. They are just charlatans. But the fact that there is the fraudulent ones means that there, is, there are the original ones. So you must esteem any man of God who is over you as a pastor, who is honestly and sincerely laboring in sound doctrine. You esteem them very highly for their work's sake. This is very apostolic. These are apostolic instructions. You esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among you. So in choosing a local church to belong, therefore, must be done prayerfully. Somebody said, well, I don't need to belong to a church. I just stay in my house, read my Bible, and pray God is everywhere. God is everywhere, but God is also in you. And not just in you, but God instructs you in his word to belong to a local assembly. You've got to belong to a local assembly. Apostolic instructions. Do not dismiss the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is as you see the day approaching. In Acts of the Apostles, they met daily in the temple and from house to house. They met daily in the temple. At the hour of prayer, Peter and John went to the temple. So you can't beat the place of the local gathering of believers. You can't beat that place. However, in deciding a local church, it must be done prayerfully, prayerfully and purposefully. You cannot just choose any church. Some people go to a church because it is close to their homes. Some people choose a church because it has a popular name. Some people choose a church because they give them food and gifts every time. Some people choose a church because their welfare package is good. You know, but you forget that there are also people who, because of their need for good medical attention, they fly to India, they fly to Europe from Africa. They fly to the best hospitals and they travel because they want the best for their health. It's not as if there are no hospitals. So in choosing a local church, you must first of all understand the purpose for the local church. You don't just enter a gathering and say, this is my church. You've got to understand the purpose of a local church. Having understood the purpose, then prayerfully, you trust God to lead you to one. Prayerfully. You know, some people just go to church because they dance and sing for hours. Well, you don't need a church to dance and sing. You can go to a nightclub. Some people like a church just because there are too many activities, drama, group, and all that. And some people will even tell you, the reason why I'm in this church is because that's my mother's church. And all of those are wrong reasons for belonging to the church, doctrinally and scripturally. Somebody say, I've been in this church long enough. I cannot afford to leave. That's still a wrong reason for belonging to a local church. And we're going to examine the scriptures clearly on what should be the ideal doctrinal reason for joining a local church. That's very critical, especially as the new year is starting. Somebody say, well, I don't want to leave that church because all my friends are there, my family is there. That's not the reason why you join a church. You can have friends and family in school. You can have friends and family in the market. You can have friends and family on the streets. You don't need to be in a church to have friends and family. So that's not enough a reason to belong to a local church. These considerations I just mentioned, they make sense to a carnal mind to a carnal mind, but they do not make sense to the doctrine of scripture. So before you choose a local church, there are certain questions to ask yourself, and I'm going to deal with them one after the other. The first question you want to ask yourself is, 
Do I want to grow spiritually? Do I want to grow spiritually? That's the first reason. That's the first question to consider before you consider a local church. Not the color of uniform the ushers are wearing, not the color of uniform their protocol, not even the TV lights in the building, not even the sound system in the building. No, all those are no reasons. Not how far is it from my house. It's just a place, don't try. I can just walk in and walk out. Any day I don't have money, I can just walk in and walk out. No, those are no reasons for considering a local church. Do I want to grow spiritually? If yes, then you must choose to attend a local church where the teaching of God's word is given first place and every member is closely mentored and monitored to understand every Bible doctrine. Why? Because spiritual growth will only come through the knowledge of God's word. And the knowledge of God's word is the knowledge of Jesus. John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made that was made. The word. And in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. In the beginning was the word. Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the knowledge of God's word is the knowledge of Jesus. That a local church where you will grow spiritually is a church where the diet, the diet fed the believer is Christ. They feed around Christ. Not motivational speaking. Brother Paul says that your faith should not rest in the wisdom of men. But in the power of God, what is the power of God? Where the word of a king is, there is power. A place where the diet is Christ. You feed on Christ every time you assemble. No extracurricular material, only Christ. You keep feeding on Christ. Brother Paul says, I count all things as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. Jesus says, I will build my church. It is his church. So when you come to his church, what you should feed on is him. You feed on Christ, not business principles. There are good business schools to go for business principles, not motivational speaking. There are good secular motivational speakers that are even better than so many pastors. So if it's motivation you're looking for, there are secular guys who are very good, who are experts in it. But if it is the church of Jesus, what you should be expecting to hear all the time is the message of a person, Christ. Brother Paul will say, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him, not from it, from him, him. The message is the message of a him. In John 1, 45, Philip found Nathanael and said, we have found him, him. That means we came for him. We didn't come for it. We didn't come for breakthrough. We didn't come for all those things. We primarily came for him. When you find him with him, you find all things. It is Jesus' church. It is his church. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Sincere. So for the milk to be qualified, if there is sincere milk of the word, it means that there is insincere milk, adulterated milk. There is poisonous milk. When you are in a local church, after three, four, five years, you cannot explain salvation. You are not in a church, you are in an, in an event center. Or you are in a town hall. Because if you are in a good local church, a church as prescribed by scripture, you should have been feeding on Christ. And if you are feeding well, you should grow after a few weeks. You should begin to grow. You should begin to grow. Because that's the essence of church, to grow spiritually. That you may grow thereby. And it will only take sincere milk for you to grow. Sincere milk. Not friends and acquaintances, sincere milk where you are taught. Remember, the mission of the church is for the equipping of the saints. The equipping of the saints, not the entertaining of the saints. The equipping of the saints. And when they are equipped, they will do the work of ministry. In Acts chapter 20, verse 20, speaking to the church at Ephesus, he said, And how I kept back nothing. That was profitable unto you. But I've showed you and I've taught you publicly and from house to house. I have showed you and I have taught you publicly 
and from house to house. I have taught you publicly and from house to house. I've kept back nothing from you that is profitable. When you are in a good local church, you grow spiritually. You are equipped. The message of Christ becomes your diet. You eat it all the time. And you know, when people begin to feed on Christ, they don't get satisfied anymore. The more you know Christ, the more you want to know him. And until you know Christ, you can never know yourself. A lot of believers are suffering from identity crisis. Today they tell you you are possessed. Tomorrow they tell you you have generational cause because sincere milk is not available in many places. All they have is just, you know, uh, chaff. Well, you, you covenant breaking, cost breaking, you know, uh, how to get there, breakthrough seminar, coconut service. All that is not church. Those are, those are town halls. The church of Jesus, believers are fed sound doctrine. The diet is Christ. It is not the crowd that defines the church. It's not the building that defines the crowd, the church. It's not the beauty of the protocol people. You know, and sometimes yeah, that church has excellence. And what they call excellence is a, a building that is decorated with fine furniture, with expensive instruments, and everybody is well dressed with good microphones and things look orderly. They call that excellence. But excellence is speech, is the teaching of God's word, is doctrine, sound teaching. Because doctrine is spirit. The spirit of excellence is the teaching of Christ. The spirit of excellence is the message of Christ. Anybody can have a fanciful hall. Anybody can have a well-decorated hall. It doesn't even have to be born again. Any good-thinking person that has money should be able to put together a hall, well, great facilities, you know, sophisticated lighting and equipment. That doesn't make it a church. The church of Jesus is the gathering of people that are saved. The assemblage of people that are born again that come together as a local body to feed on the diet Christ. And in such a place, there is well-defined leadership, well-defined leadership, where the pastor of that church is a laborer in word and doctrine and is feeding the people in that building sincere milk to grow thereby. You can't afford to waste another 12 months of your life in a wrong place called church. You can't afford it. It's too expensive to waste another 12 months of your life Translate that to hours. Translate that to minutes. Translate that to seconds. You see what colossal waste it will be for you to be in any place where the message of Christ is not truly taught, where the doctrine, the, the, the diet Christ is not presented to believers. So spiritual growth will come by revelation of who Jesus is, all he has done for us, and what he, he is doing through us today. Spiritual growth will come by the revelation of who Jesus is, what he has done for us, the resources he has made available to us, and the ability that is ours in him. That is how spiritual growth will come. If you see Colossians chapter 1 verse 9, Brother Paul talks about how growth will come. Colossians chapter 1 verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. We desire you to grow. And how will you grow? You become filled with the knowledge of his will. You become filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. When he was talking to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 9, look at the prerequisite for growth that Brother Paul gave to the church at Ephesus. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ which he wrought in Christ, that the church may know, number one, that you may know who you are, the hope of your calling. Number two, that you may know the riches of your inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? To us, what who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. In chapter 3 of the same Ephesians, chapter 3, verse 16, he now says that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That's spiritual growth. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That you're being rooted and grounded in love. You'll be rooted, you'll be grounded through teaching. You'll be rooted, you'll be grounded through teaching. That you may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, length, depth, and height. 
and to know. That's the beauty of being in a Bible teaching church. A New Testament Bible teaching, not just a Bible teaching church. A New Testament Bible teaching church. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Look at the way Brother Paul will put it in the book of Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Brother Paul puts it like this in Colossians 2, 6. He says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. You walk in him the same way you received him. You received him by grace through faith. You walk in him by grace through faith. But watch this. Rooted and built up. Spiritual growth. Rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith. As you have been taught, you must be taught. As you have been taught, abounding dairy with thanksgiving. Then he warns, beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Beware. He will just mess you around. Teach you useless things. Give you religion to just be practicing religion. Feeling pious. No growth. No maturity. You can't defend your stand in Christ. You're tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine because you're not feeding on the sincere milk of the world so you can grow thereby. Look at Philemon chapter 6. Brother Paul now says that the communication of your faith becomes effectual. When you are fed, you come to a place where you acknowledge, epignosis, accurate. A good local church is where you grow spiritually. You are fed with the accurate, precise, exact knowledge of Christ, revealed knowledge, comprehensive insight. You are taught Christ from the pages of the scriptures. John 5, 39, he says, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. And finally, before I conclude on the first point, I have five points to go. Things to consider in choosing a good local church. I have five points to go. This is just one. Tomorrow I will deal with two. Acts 20, 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. The word of his grace will build you up. If you are not feeding in the word of his grace, what is the word of his grace? The message of the finished work of Christ. The message of the finished work of Christ. That is the diet. That is the sincere milk of the word that enables a man grow. He says, and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. We feed on Christ. We feed on the diet of the world. We feed on the revelation of Jesus. So if you're in a local church right now where this is not key, it's not focused, it's not central, you may start thinking about moving out of that church. You may have to start thinking. And for those of you that follow my teachings who have no local church to attend, like I have said from the beginning, if you don't have a good local church in your area, you need to shoot us an email asking for a good local church. And we have encouraged people in locations where there's no local church who have followed my teachings for some time to begin a teaching, you know, a, a, a campus, a campus where other believers who follow my teaching can assemble together and feed from the word of God. And if you want to start that or you want to be a part of one campus in your location, all you need to do today is shoot a mail to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com and we'll be honored and glad to give you some directions on how you can belong to a local church where you are fed the right diet, the message of Christ, the gospel of the finished work of Christ, the gospel of life and immortality that is brought to light through the gospel. I'm excited, friends, and I'm excited to be able to bring clarity. We will continue with the second point tomorrow. Today is, do you desire spiritual growth? If you do desire spiritual growth, then the first thing to consider in looking for a good local church is the diet, which is the message of his death, burial, and resurrection as the main food eaten in every service. A man of God said to me, Dr. Damira, if I have to preach Christ, that was buried and rose, it will be boring. People will soon be tired and I will soon run out of material. I said, because you don't know the message. Because if you know the message, it's one message you cannot exhaust. Three days and night was all of eternity compressed in three days. It takes you a billion lifetimes to exhaust that message. You can't finish it. It's more, it's much more than a man can consume in a lifetime. Except the revelation 
has not been given to you. And if a man of God doesn't have revelation, he's a blind leader. And if the blind lead the blind, they all fall in a ditch. Today, those are my few words to share with you. Share with other people about this broadcast. Encourage more people to come. Let's liberate men out of the shackles of religion and bring them into the glorious sunshine, liberty of songs. I'm excited, friends. I look forward to connecting and sharing more with you tomorrow. Enjoy your day. Amen. Hello. I hope you have been blessed by that wonderful message. The Bible says, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. For you to grow spiritually, you need to hear, study, and meditate on the word. You need to not only hear, but to also read and see. And that is why you need the Christocentric meal. This is a book that reveals to you who you are in Christ, what you have in Christ, and what Christ can do through you. This book interprets and breaks down the word into daily meals, making it easier for you to understand and study, build up and strengthen your inner man, all the while growing your relationship with God and your confidence as a believer. To order this life-changing book and other titles, DVDs and CDs by Dr. Abel Damina, call the number or email the address on the screen. Starting the new year with this book is your first step to guaranteeing an enriched life and new year.